a disclosure, I am a physician. And maybe it fell to me visiting the sick sort of naturally kind of came that way. But visiting the sick and getting paid to take care of the sick are two very, very different things. So it really has to be a disclosure on this that I am a surgeon. That it, it, wouldn't, it, it, it affords me an opportunity to participate in the care um, of people who are ill and injured. And as uh, Sir William Osler, who sort of the father of, of internal medicine, particularly in the United States, uh, had said, you know, the great grace of being a physician is you're afforded the opportunity to attend man's coming and man's going. And I think that that is very true. But then there's a separate element of that, that because I feel comfortable in the setting of someone who is ill, um, I'm allowed to actually go visit the sick in, in a way that other people may not feel comfortable. And that's kind of why I didn't want to do this as a PowerPoint. I want to, we're going to have some, some questions I'm going to throw out to you. I, I, I do want this to be formational. Yes, there is going to be information thrown out because particularly I want to go through, uh, as I had said, a scripture hitting Old and New Testament things. I'm going to introduce some saints. I, I feel pretty safe saying you're not going to recognize a couple of them. And that's pretty cool. So I love history, as you know. So we're going to talk about some history. Um, I want folks to come to recognize the radical change in understanding of illness and natural and supernatural role of community that the church has brought into the world. So that, when you leave, that is what I want you mainly to leave with. In addition, assuming we get to it, time, questions, things like that, I have a couple of stories I want to share. Some people may have heard them, some have not, relating to my history in, in, in Minnesota that has led to me actually having lots of spare time starting in July, <clears throat> um, as well as to discuss some opportunities for service uh, to carry out this, uh, this work of mercy, which is, of course, uh, we're going to talk about visiting the sick. I would be remiss if I did not start with Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Um, and I, I don't know if Father read through it last month. Uh, it is, for me, this is almost a foundational scripture for my Catholicism. So this will be something worth taking away. I know you have heard it. I will read it with my best, no, I won't read it with radio announcer voice. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him. And he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger, and welcome you, or naked, and clothe you? When did we see you ill, or in prison, and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of these least brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger, or naked or ill or in prison, and not minister to your needs? He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This section of Scripture says a whole lot about what it is to sort of understand the Catholic view, the world view. How do we look at the whole universe? And so 
of course, it talks about caring for the sick or visiting the sick. And, and Jesus separates out a series of groups in here. And I want to ask you, so what's the obvious first two groups? Everybody talks about these first two groups. Yeah, sheep and goats. Sheep and goats. And, you know, the, the goats, their punishment is a separation. And for people who study, what is the pain of hell? It is this pain of separation. And I want you to keep that in mind as we talk about illness and the sick. But there's another group or set of groups that really he talks about going through here. And you can look at any of the different, whether it's a naked person running around or whether it's somebody thirsty or hungry, ill, in prison. There is that person who, in context of today's talk, is ill. What's the other group? Well, they're sheep and goats. Both who were not put in the ill group. So the, you could, the, the, the classic breakdown is everybody goes sheep and goats. Now, come on. I mean, you wouldn't think I would just come and I'm just going to rehash everything I heard on EWTN. I mean, I'll do that. I like EWTN. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Having said that, I want to give you something more. So if you're not ill, you are? Well, well. well you're healthy. You're healthy. There's a healthy group here of people. <laughs> Which raises the question when I look at this, I say, well, what is health? What is health? Can you define it for me? The absence of sickness. See, health is often defined by the absence of illness. Health is often defined by the absence of illness. Um, any other thoughts? Being in right order. Health is being in right order. And I think that that is, I think that's very true. Uh, health is in being in right order. Is it, um, is it ever perfect? Can you be in a state of perfect health? Having said that, what I want to preface this with is, I'll put the surgeon hat, the physician <coughs> educator hat on for a second. There's a quality of life years term that is used to look at the impact of um, uh, expenditure on health. And I say, okay, I want to take somebody who has a zero in health. They would be, well, they're dead. So let's do 0 0.00001. So they're alive, but they've got very poor health. And then we measure them relative to a one. Now this is an economic theoretical construct. In a theological context, is there a person walking around who has a health of one? No. No, there's not. And so defining health as the absence of illness, to a lot of extent, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's, uh, that's, how, that's how a lot of people do look at that. But let me, let me read you this and, and see what you think about it. Let's see. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 31. Doctor. So yes, sir. When you're, when you're speaking of health, though, are you only speaking of physical or also mental? Doctor, when you're speaking of health, are you only speaking of physical or are you also speaking of mental? <laughs> well, now, is it, did, I, did, I, did I quote you correctly? Or? Oh, very well. Okay. And let me throw in spiritual. Yeah. You now, go. what do you mean? What do we mean by health? What do we mean by illness? And so Luke chapter 5, verse 31 Jesus said to them in reply, Those who are healthy do not need a physician, but the sick do. Who did Jesus come for? The sick. He came for the sick. Oh, wait, I thought he came for all of us. Think about that for a second. Therefore, we're all sick. We are all sick. In a manner of speaking, we are all sick and in need of a physician. As we think about visiting the sick, and as we think about health, those questions of, well, what do you mean by health, and in what dimensions do you mean health, are very, very important. On the subject of health, is health an absolute good? Meaning, is this 
Is this something that in every time, in every place, is a good? Yes, I would say yes. I say yes, yes. In what ways is it a good? Because it, um, what was the terminology you used before? It, it, it conforms with our well-being or something like that? Health conforms with our well-being, a state of, of uh, order. Order, yeah, order. order, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that is a, that's a good. That is absolutely. But, yeah. but like, but like wealth, we can start to believe it's due to us, and therefore we don't need the physician. It, it, like wealth, uh, it is something that allows us to believe in our own self-sufficiency. I, I think that is a very good point. That's very important. And I deal with a lot of people who are towards the end of life, and you see a lot of different responses to that state where people will go to extraordinary lengths to preserve their life, that there is a time we all go home. So is it an absolute good? Now, St. John Cassian, and before I go into St. John, I want to tell you just a list of saints. So as you hear them, the name won't shock you. So St. John Cassian, uh, actually uh, St. Ign Ignatius of Loyola, a lot of, uh, of different ascetic Spirituality comes out of St. John Cassian. Uh, St. Basil, confessor and doctor. I think people are generally familiar with St. Basil. St. John Chrysostom. Uh, uh, St. Barsanufius. Now, I, did, I had to bone up on Barsanufius. But St. Barsanufius. Uh, St. Dorotheus of Gaza. Uh, so St. Dorotheus and uh, St. Dositheus. We'll have a nice story we'll share in a little bit. Uh, St. Uh, Gregory Nazianzus who was the uh, Archbishop of Constantinople, and uh, Saint Seraphim. Okay, in Eastern Catholic terms, he's, he's, he's the venerable Seraphim, but the Russian Orthodox call him Saint Seraphim. So, a couple of different saints throughout the age. Saint Seraphim, 18th century, so more recent than some of the other ones. But Saint John Cassian, or John the Ascetic. Among human affairs, nothing merits being held as good in the true sense of the word, except virtue which leads us to God and makes us adhere to this immutable good. On the other hand, there's no evil other than sin, which by separating us from God, who is good, unites us to the devil, who is evil. So again, virtue in this life is good. Health? Yeah, it's a relative good. In fact, probably understood, really, it's a blessing. It is a specific blessing. Now, can you work hard and achieve a blessing? No. No, no, that would, it's what we would call Pelagianism, or at best, semi-Pelagianism, as a heresy. You cannot earn God's graces. And one of the things that happened in the fall was we realized that in Adam's preternatural state, he had the ability to not die. So in a sense, his body and the intent of our bodies was that they would be immortal. Now, truly speaking, if it has the capacity to die, it's not immortal. However, in Adam's pre-fall state, we say that he in fact could have not died. After the sin of Adam, he lost the grace that allowed him to not die. In other words, the grace of his health, the grace of his bodily integrity was revealed to be just that, a grace. And one of the reasons he was stripped of that, one of them, is a gift in that it causes him to recognize that he is not, in fact, God. And that's important to understand when we come forward to our time and think about health and illness and whether we merit it, earn it, give it to people, it is a grace of God, whether I wield it with at the end of a knife, or a, a pill, or a chiropractic <coughs> manipulation, or whatever. Actual healing comes from God. So then I ask the question, why illness? Why is there such a thing as illness?
Any thoughts? To uh, bring us to understand our dependency on God, and <coughs> we are not capable of sustaining ourselves necessarily. We need the grace of God. Yeah, it's part of what we learn from illness is a contingency. And one of the challenges in this contingency is um, really I think we learned from Job in chapter 2 Satan basically confronts God and says all that a man has he will give for his life but now put forth your hand and touch his bone and his flesh and surely he will blaspheme you to your face and the Lord said to Satan he is in your power only spare his life so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with severe boils from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. So illness, being allowed by God, in this case, is it to test Job's goodness? I see your head shaking no. You say no. Why is that? <clears throat> So, in the case of Job, I mean, I think God was confident in his faith in, in God himself and later in Christ. Taking that away from him, I don't think it was uh, to test him so much as it was God's uh, confidence that Job's uh, health, well-being, uh, family, those sorts of things uh, were what he required, I guess, to... Uh, lay his life down for God in that sense. Uh, it was, his health wasn't contingent on his belief in God, and so God was confident in that sense. To, to have that taken away from him wouldn't have an impact on his relationship with him. So God was confident in Job. He had faith in Job. And what the test was, was a demonstration of what was already there. And I think this is an important concept for us to get in mind, oftentimes there are people who have an idea that tests are that we have to achieve this to be acceptable to God, or we have to achieve this to be good, when in fact the test is about demonstrating what's already there, in some senses, in some senses, and that was certainly in Job's case. So I go back to uh, one of the points we discussed a little bit earlier, who then are the sick? And we already said, in some sense, it's everyone. Yeah. What else? What? There, there are opportunity. People. Say again? There are opportunity. There are To are show God's love to others. They create an opportunity to show God's love for others. That's very true. And they are people... So if we think of the sick as being afflicted by anything that they are wrestling with. Their own, if you will, in Job's case, they're his own private demon. You know, there's a lot of sickness that is, uh, that is out there. Now, these people who are sick, do they just wallow in their misery? Do they have duties? Do they have responsibilities? And it's an odd, content, or an odd thing to think of. Do the sick have duties? And in Catholic moral theology, bioethics, do the sick have duties? What do you think? They have a duty to trust in God. They have a duty to trust in God. All That's those who are suffering and are also called to unite that suffering with the cross. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Rejoice in hope, endure in affliction, in affliction, sorry, and persevere in prayer. Endure in affliction and persevere in prayer. So this is very, very, uh, a very difficult thing to say. A uh, difficult thing to do. Because what are the effects? What, what happens with illness? Per you're afflicted with illness. Weakness. Weakness. Weakness comes, it, you know, it, 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 yes, weakness. What else? What kind of brings a problem across the Frustration and that it can just be difficult to pray because you're just not in a mental state that you're prepared to. Frustration from distractibility from your weakness. What else? It can bring anger. 
absolutely can bring anger. So, in this setting, and in fact, uh, uh, Saints uh, Dorotheus and Dositheus. So, Dorotheus was uh, an abbot, and uh, these are part of the these ascetic uh, uh, desert fathers. And Dositheus was sort of this wild and crazy militant kind of guy who decided to give up his life for God. And he became he was he was actually working in the infirmary caring for all of the um, ill that would be brought to the monastery and he contracted tuberculosis. And uh, Dorotheus hearing that uh, Dositheus was ill said, you know, ask him, he said, now are you praying? That was his primary concern is are you praying? And Dositheus said I am trying to pray. Please pray for me. Pray for me. And Dorotheus said that he would do that. That he would pray for him. Because of these problems in focusing and attention. And in fact, when Dositheus was brought to Dorotheus on a, on a sheet, because Dositheus was so ill that he could no longer move, and Dorotheus asked him, are you praying? He goes, I can't. I cannot pray. I, I'm too weak. And he goes, subsist in knowing God's love for you. And the community prayed for Dositheus. And he did eventually die. But this demonstration of prayer and uniting your sufferings to the cross of Christ is very important. Now, think about Dositheus and his response to his illness. What does that allow you, or what causes that in him? What's the response that causes him to pray? So fear, fear would cause him to pray, potentially, potentially. I mean, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not the, not the end of wisdom, but uh, um, certainly the beginning of wisdom. What else? I think to make something valuable out of the sickness or the pain. To give it, to give it value rather than just letting it take over. To Everything. give value and meaning to the suffering. Yeah. Well, and in fact, Jesus Christ gives us that meaning. And Dositheus, in this case, unites his own suffering to that, giving it meaning. And so here we see the... Scott? Uh, one prays out of hope. One prays out of hope, yes. And part of what comes uh, into hope is this virtue that comes from being sick. There's a virtue that's at work here. Because somebody who is oriented towards Christ will reflect when they're separated out in their illness, reflect on their own mortality. This came up in the meeting. Tempest fugit, memento mori, time is fleeting, remember death. And so this causes them to focus on their contingency, that they are not in fact God. It gives them an opportunity to pray, in effect, going to the desert. They've gone to the desert. They can then develop a virtue of patience. And that endurance is what they're called to develop. Now, uh, there's a, a book, Resilience and the Virtue of Fortitude. Uh, Titus is the author, not like the Roman Titus, but it's Craig Titus, he's, so he's a different Titus. Um, but it's a Thomistic exploration of the development of virtue. And one of the things that, that you run across in this idea of resiliency and developing fortitude is that if you have a vulnerability in a stress situation, it creates a risk environment. That negotiated successfully increases your strength, decreases your vulnerabilities. You grow in virtue. So it's a model for developing virtue. And from Romans uh, chapter 5, we kind of hear how this works. Not only that, but we even boast of our afflictions, knowing that affliction produces endurance, and endurance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. 
And this model of developing character, we hear about character, we hear about virtue, but in seeing how this can be modeled, character, as we develop, develop it, allows us to channel our biology, our temperament, our passions, our appetites, to Christ. We are able to take what we identify with our intellect as the good, we inform our will of what the good is, and because of our character, we can actually channel ourselves to choose that good and remain faithful. So someone who has in their heart Jesus Christ and is oriented towards Jesus Christ, that episode of illness or affliction can have a very, very different meaning than someone who otherwise doesn't have Jesus Christ. So now we get into the question of somebody who does not have Jesus Christ and is afflicted so. What's their response? Despair. Despair is is one of the big ones that comes out. They realize their contingency, but they have no answers. Scott. Uh, I might say lack of meaning or... Lack of meaning, absolutely. Somebody who is struggling now, recognizing that in the fullness of their health, and I wasn't 100% sure I was going to do this, but this Dostoevsky quote is perfect. Um, <clears throat> so, a healthy man is always an earthly, material man, but as soon as he falls ill, and the normal earthly order of his organism is disturbed, then the possibility of another world makes itself known to him at once, and as the illness worsens, his relations with this new world, paraphrase, become closer. So we have a person now who, confronted with their own mortality, recognizes that all the good health and everything they had is, uh, is fleeting and is now gone. They give themselves, they can potentially give themselves over to despair. Um, selfishness. Uh, selfishness? In what way? In incredibly selfish. Um, all that the, the hurting person can think about is hurt. And, and it just becomes all about them and the pain and what they're suffering. Absolutely. They can become completely focused else. inward on their pain, their suffering, uh, and become locked into it. And in fact, uh, Jean-Claude Larcher, who is uh, he's actually an Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox uh, uh, moral theologian, a uh, book on the theology of illness, but this opens up the way to demonic activity. Uh, they can begin to develop into this soul troubling passions. Uh, we talk about some of fear, anxiety, uh, weariness, despair. And uh, as this soul despairs, while the physical illness is a problem, it is the spiritual problem that is the real danger. Yes, sir, Tom. Uh, yeah, would that also include uh, depression? Absolutely, it can de include depression. I mean, that's where, in the Catholic Church, the Catholic ethos, we don't really differentiate among a variety of different aspects of illness. I mean, we kind of subcategorize a lot, but to say that, well, this illness doesn't count or this illness does. No, mental health issues absolutely play into this. Because one of the problems with illness, and we mentioned it a little bit, is isolation. Is isolation. Depression, you isolate yourself. The plague, everyone else isolates you. <laughs> so, I mean, but it leads to isolation. And that's one of the things. If we go back to the uh, sheep and the goats, what was the ultimate punishment? Damnation. Well, damnation being isolation. You are removed forever from God and from community because you have removed yourself from that community. So in depression, because of this biology, people can move down this path. No different than any other illness. It's no different than any other illness. And the, the difficulty is the mental illnesses are harder to see. 
So we think they're not real. That's not the case. They're very real. So absolutely that plays into that. John? Where does the factor of having to seek out help from a doctor uh, in addition to prayer and suffering? Well, um, uh, being a doctor, I'm very fond of the Sirach quotes that uh, talk about going uh, and seeking out a physician. So, um, what the church uh, desert fathers, the ascetics, would say is that it is not a sign of weakness or lack of faith to seek out a physician. It is, in fact, an act of humility, recognizing that, in fact, you are not so solely self-sufficient that God has given us uh, skills uh, and uh, wisdom, chapter 1, all wisdom comes from God. So it, it, if we understand that the physician's ability to heal, the skill and all that, um, that comes from God, and whatever the physician does, the ultimate healing comes from God, that, that's absolutely a good thing to do. There is no reason to avoid physicians and suffer on your own because not just in the selfishness one of the aspects that you can get into is pride and presumption and you can presume upon God's miraculous power that he in fact is going to heal you miraculously because of your faith he's going to do that now the old story and, and maybe you, you all have heard this the flood and the waters rising people in the house it's like, oh, God's going to save us. We're praying. You know, the sheriff comes by and says, hey, you know, flood's coming. They stay in the house and they pray. Water's rising. They're up on the top of the house and, you know, canoes come by and say, hey, you know, flood's going to wipe you out. So we're praying. It's going to be great. And then helicopter, they're standing on top of the chimney. And the helicopter comes by and says, you guys, the house is about to get swept away. I'm praying. It's going to be fine. And the house gets swept away and they all drown. And I mean, they're very devout, faithful people. They go to heaven. And, and, but they asked Jesus, they said, well, now, we prayed, we thought you would save us. He goes, I sent you the sheriff, I sent you the canoes, and I sent you the helicopter. You know, what do you want? So, just a brief aside on the, on the physician thing, because part of that is why I think it's important to go and, and visit the sick, because that way they don't feel alone uh, and have to kind of figure this out. Now, where this comes into play, for instance, the flood was still coming in, in the joke. <laughs> you know, there's still a flood. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, as Paul is basically praying that this affliction leave him, and we're not going to get into what the affliction was because nobody knows. Three times I begged the Lord about this, that it might leave me. Actually, I should say, or who it was. There's some thought it was an angry parishioner. Uh, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness. I will rather boast most gladly of my weaknesses in order that the power of Christ may dwell with me. Um, it is interesting to see the number of people who, when they go to the physician, are actually evangelizing them. They get to be a living witness of the power of prayer and of the devout life. So... In no senses are we commanded to abstain from medicine or in any way abstain from community. So, again, uh, the, the sick are among us. We are all afflicted. And as we talked about health, you can become uh, convinced of your own righteousness, goodness. Uh, a side story on that, that when I was back in Guam, back in the day, in the Navy, um, a lot of very devout Catholic people there. And they would have these various prayer groups. Well, a young, uh, a young man, an individual I was taking care of who had gotten hit by a dump truck, badly broken, bad head injury, bad fractures, contractures, all kinds of things. Uh, I had put him together, but I can't fix anybody's brain. So he had bad head injury. He and his wife came in, and they said that uh, he, he, she was quite bright. It's the first time I'd seen her happy in the year that I had known her. And he said, well, um, he's going to be healed Really? Okay. Uh, how, how is that going to happen? Uh, well, we're part of a prayer group, and, and uh, we've been, uh, we're, we're praying for his healing. I go, well, that's, you know, that's fantastic. That's, that's wonderful. 
Um, why do you think so? Sh you're so sure he's going to be healed? Because we have been told that in September he will be healed. Oh, how did that happen? Well, the Mahalna Inkong uh, gave a, a spiritual reading. Hmm, hmm, I see. So let's talk about that a little bit. And basically, there's, they, they had seen some miraculous cures come through this island healer. And since they were then pronounced that they were going to be healed, they believed it to be true because they had seen people miraculously cured. I said, okay, no problem. I see how this goes. If by chance, just hypothetically, your husband's not miraculously cured in September, I, please, before you decide to do anything, just, just come talk to me. Just come talk to me. Uh, so they came in, 1st of October, not healed. And what do you think their feeling was? Disappointed. Cheated. Cheated. Disappointed. Despair. despair. That was the word I was looking for. Whenever you hear despair come out, that's like you can hear the breath of hell. And that was, I mean, I run across this so many times, it was like, I know, what, I know where this one's going. So I said, okay, you have been exposed to the breath of hell. But I've seen all these people be cured. They've all been cured. There's miraculous stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, as uh, St. Gregory Nazianzus tells us, do not admire every form of health and do not condemn every illness. And I think this is one of those telltale times. You know, not every cure, and I say cure specifically instead of healing, not every cure comes from God. Um, all healing does. All healing does. And that may or may not involve a physical cure. And I think that's an important thing to kind of uh, to keep in mind. So, we've talked about this despair and isolation. These people who are isolated, there are physical effects of the isolation. So it's not just the, um, the loneliness aspect of it, but actual uh, research has been done. Uh, review, uh, 2012, 70 papers published on the physical effects of isolation. Uh, increased heart disease, malnutrition, quote-unquote negative health behaviors. A fellow by the name of Bruce Alexander is a psychologist on the subject of addiction. And one of the things that he uh, uh, points out is that among the rat models that they've tested, socializing the animals did far more to decrease the addiction than any other intervention. Social animals, social beings, us included, uh, require uh, the presence of other people. And so when we are commanded to visit the sick, as we are commanded to do, part of this is to be able to prevent this isolation. So I, I don't necessarily want to use science to prove scripture, you can, because Scripture is a good thing. Um, but in this particular case, it really does bear out that we should visit the sick for their sake, to prevent their isolation, to prevent their physical decline, to help them be able to get the help, to recognize that they need help. And well, perhaps they no. should make themselves available to be visited so that we can grow closer as, as examples of Christ. Well, they should make themselves uh, available to be visited. And an interesting um, uh, segue, and thank you for that. Uh, check will be in the mail. Um, <laughs> was that the right time you told me that? Perfect, okay. yeah. Um, there's a lot of, hit, I love history. You know, we keep talking about doing some of these different historical talks. Where was the first hospital that we would recognize as a hospital made. Where was it? Rome? Nope. It was not Rome for the home viewers. <laughs> it was not Rome. Africa? Uh, it was not Africa for the home viewers. Italy? It was not Italy. Anywhere in Italy. Nowhere in Italy. Not Rome, not anywhere else. So uh, it actually was uh, St. Saint, Saint Basil. Uh, actually built the first hospital in Caesarea uh, in the Middle East, kind of in Palestine area, um, in about 370 A.D. 
Now, there were other areas that you could get care for the sick. Typically in Italy or in Rome, they were more like veterinarian offices for the slaves uh, than they were actual hospitals as we understand them. Uh, in China, earlier, there were places that you could get medicine and places the poor could get care or get money and food. Uh, but a true hospital, as we think of hospitals today, is a Christian invention. I had read in other contexts that it actually was a Muslim invention. Now, the hospital in Jerusalem, Knights of Malta and all that, that came through the Muslim. Well, how? Well, those were all Greek territories. The hospitals were already there. So, um, in fact, the first hospital was called a basilia, or a, a little kingdom. So it was like a small city. And they organized nurse corps, even in the 5th century. So long before there was a Muhammad. And actually, we export, I say we, Christians, exported the idea of a hospital and care for the sick to India, where medicine had advanced and, and in the use of these hospitals. So the whole idea of having the sick available to be visited really is a Christian invention. Now, part of it is to be able to care for these people. Um, part of it was in the early church, I said that we didn't really dif discriminate between is it physical, is it mental, or is it spiritual. Now, mental and physical would be less of an issue than spiritual. Spiritual is what will give you eternal damnation. Physical and mental actually can help you gain salvation. So we do make those distinctions. But one of the other things we didn't really make a distinction about was whether you were poor or whether you were sick. So the early hospitals combined both facilities uh, to be able to care for the poor and the sick, provide housing, and provide care. Uh, the uh, St. Lawrence, when he was asked to give the treasures of the church, he brought out the poor and the sick. They are the treasures of the church. Uh, so that as we come through history, the idea of caring for the sick and for caring for the poor is in, in the way that we do it in the modern world, at least up and through the Enlightenment, is really a Christian understanding. Because the sick and the poor, or anyone who was afflicted in the old order, they earned that punishment. It was considered an affliction, merited by their own sins. So, we've been commanded to visit the sick, one reason to visit the sick, that we help them, so that's a reason to visit the sick. Is there a third reason to visit the sick? Yes, sir. Well, I can argue that, so I'd posit that the only reason to visit the sick, um, so you talked about the definition of sickness, I imagine that as something less than perfection, goodness, life that comes from God as original sin came to life, we lost that. Um, the only reason to help someone who's sick would be to ultimately bring them back to God. Anything else we're doing as far as medicine or any other sort of healing is really just a bandage on the temporal consequences of original sin, which anyone who's baptized would be uh, spiritually separated from. So ultimately, if, if we're physicians, but we're not leading them back to Christ, um, I, know, I guess in my opinion we'd be bandaging the temporal consequence of that original sin and not... All, uh, Jesus didn't give people back their sight or help them walk so that they could walk, but so that they could learn to love and follow Him. And if we're not doing that, ultimately we're not really doing anything for them. Well, in fact, um, your check's in the mail too because that's a really good segue as well. Um, when Jesus healed the paralytic man, there he was in front of all the, uh, you know, the scribes and Pharisees, and he said, your sins are forgiven. And everyone went nuts! And he said, what? That, that troubles you? But I tell him to get up and walk, and that would be more acceptable. So he tells God, take up your mat and walk, so that the glory of God may be shown in you. So what you say is exactly right. I mean, it, that part of this healing is to demonstrate that, that, that uh, power of God. One of the things, as a future physician, to keep in mind, I have that, I know that. Um, 
to keep in mind is that when you are taking care of the sick, as we said, too much pain. Uh, how much is too much? Ah, this is a prudential judgment. Too much pain, too much suffering, um, uh, too much confusion. They can't pray. They can't pray. They, they're robbed of their personalities. This is one of the issues. Actually, uh, uh, Sanjay Gupta on CNN has this great article. It's not a scientific article, but it's a good article. Talking about opioid prescription. And one of the problems with it is we get people so drugged up, they lose their personalities. They lose their ability to interact. And so that's the kind of thing we have to weigh out on the pain. But the fact of the matter is, if someone is suffering horribly, we can alleviate that suffering. And in fact, we are called to do that. Um, it, it has been suggested in some quarters that we should withhold medicine so that they can suffer in a good way. No, 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 no. That would be evil. <laughs> we should never enhance somebody else's suffering. Um, that, uh, that they would uh, uh, not, not be made well. Now, God as, for instance, as a surgeon, sometimes I'll cut a limb off. Or sometimes, you know, we'll cauterize wounds or things that uh, are very painful for the good of the whole person. And Jesus tells us, you know, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Better that you go in without a hand than the whole body uh, goes in, body and soul goes into Gehenna. So there are times when the divine physician will apply a rather stern medicine. <laughs> well, it's... It's God, you know. He's, that's, we, we should not judge him whether he give, brings us to uh, flowers or whether he, uh, uh, you know, cuts us to cure us because the intent is to cure. So in that sense, so we've got, we've got two reasons to visit the sick still. There's a third one out there that I'm fishing for. But for ourselves. Yes, absolutely, for ourselves. For ourselves. And again, St. Gregory Nazianzus has a little talk on that. Why would you think it be for yourself? I think at least in part to better recognize that your health is a blessing and, and not um, something merited. So the idea of health is a blessing, you recognize your own contingency, dependence on God, in somebody else's suffering, that's absolutely the case. That is absolutely the case. I think also I heard this morning on Relevant Radio, um, we'll never get the chance to wipe God's face so we can do it to our brothers. We will never get the chance to wipe God's face so we can do it for our brothers. Mm -hmm. I think that is uh, absolutely, that's very, that is beautiful. St. Gregory says, Let us respect the illness that accompanies sanctity and offer homage to those whose sufferings have led to victory. For it may be that among these ill persons there is hidden another Job. So keep in mind that while these people in sanctity are uniting themselves to Christ, we can participate in that. So it is for our own good as well. I mean, Jesus gives us a command to go do it. So that's sufficient. <laughs> but it just so happens that there are some very good things that come out from it. So... Hopefully, in the course of this lecture, discussion, we've been able to clarify the idea that this changing role of illness and understanding of illness from before Jesus until Jesus and see how the church has worked as an instrument of mercy, instrument of mercy in the world. But the other thing I hope that you take away from this is these three reasons why visiting the sick are extremely important. And finally, given the time in that, um, I'll hold off on other stories. But for opportunities to visit the sick, I think it is very important to know that, first off, Bob Laney has asked for people to come visit him. That's an easy one. He makes himself, he makes himself very open to people come visit him. So now you won't, you won't, I don't think he'll be taking him out for groceries. I, I mean, until he goes home, and then you take him out for groceries. Um, so that I, got to, I think I got the last opportunity on that one. I'm not sure. Uh, but go visit Bob. The nursing homes, all of them, have people who need to be visited. And you can just call and ask, you know, is there somebody there whose nobody is visiting? They're there. I mean, I go, um, one of the stories I was going to share is how I started going to nursing homes just to visit. Won't go into that. 
But you can go and people are lonely. And just to break that isolation, don't go to evangelize verbally. You're going to evangelize with your presence. If they ask you to pray with them, pray with them. Absolutely. Pray quietly. Pray, you know, pray, pray for them while you're there. But just your presence. You don't have to do anything. Now, uh, for instance, uh, visiting Father Wellsbacher uh, when he was in the hospital, I somehow I managed to always follow, like right after Father Stromberg got there, and Father Stromberg brings like a little book or newspaper, brings some chocolates. Maybe he brings some chocolates. There'll be a few less, less left after I got there. But just to visit and spend time with people is all that it takes. Um, I specifically did not want to get into uh, bringing the Eucharist. That is an extremely good thing, but that is actually different than just visiting the sick. And the same with the anointing of the sick. I mean, these are great topics for maybe future, future talks, but this is just about you personally being the presence of Jesus Christ to a person who is otherwise lonely, isolated, and potentially lost. The, the hospitals, the nursing homes, these are spiritual battlegrounds. And um, I encourage you to, uh, to step onto the battlefield. So, I thank you for your kind attention. If there are any other questions or things, please feel free.